So thanks everyone for coming to this AIDS Institute Grand Rounds. I'm Rafi Landovitz from the, from the Care Center. We're incredibly lucky today to have a very special guest from out of town. Dr. Ken Mayer has come all the way from freezing cold Boston where it's warmer than it is here. Um, not, not today. To, to speak with us. Um, Ken's a long-term friend of the AIDS program here and of many people in the audience. Um, Ken uh, is uh, the co-director of the Fenway Institute and also the director of the research there. He began his training at, with, uh, with his undergrad work at UPenn, got his MD at Northwestern University School of Medicine, then completed additional work in advanced epidemiology. He trained at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Beth Israel Hospital, and he's currently professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, uh, in addition to those illustrious titles, um, Ken is uh, well sought after by local, national, and international committees and advisory boards for his international expertise on sexual health, STI treatment and epidemiology, HIV treatment, prevention and epidemiology, um, and expertise um, in care and treatment of HIV-infected patients. Um, he's part of the leadership groups of a number of the DAIDS funded networks, including the HVTN, the Vaccine Trials Network, the HIV, HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, the Adolescent Trials Network, the ATN, um, uh, and all those networks. He leads numerous protocols. And um, I will tell you that he is um, uh, uh, an extremely well published author having published 688 peer-reviewed pu uh, publications. And I have to say, Ken, really? Your CV is 252 pages, uh, regardless. <laughs> Ken is a all great right, right, friend right. to all of us, and me Stop. in particular. And we're very excited to have him here to talk about the new normal sexual health in the TASP and PrEP era. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. There's so many uh, individuals in this audience who I've learned a great deal from over the years and uh, who've contributed so much to this field. So uh, one of the challenges is, you know, bringing Coles to Newcastle. I mean, I don't really want to tell you things you already know. So, you know, uh, so many men, so little time, so much to say, so little time. Uh, so, so what I'd like to do in this talk today, um, give a postcard from the edge, give you the context about what friendly, what friendly health is like and what's happening now talk about um, the new paradigm, which I think is very clear to most of the people in the room, but just sort of what it means and what are the challenges and opportunities there. Uh, get back a little bit into just how, particularly around sexual health for sexual gender minority people, thinking about the diverse subgroups and what's the, what are the implications of some of these uh, interventions because they involve engaging the healthcare system, which has not always been a very positive um, interaction for a lot of the people we want now to avail themselves of the benefits and talk about um, the importance of providers uh, sort of to close this out. So Fenway Health is a federally qualified community health center. It was founded in 1971, uh, downtown Boston. It was not funded as an LGBT health center, but because a lot of the people who worked there were sexual gender minority people, and then with the advent of the AIDS epidemic in the early 80s, it sort of became um, uh, the, main, the main organization in New England dealing with community-based HIV-related issues. It's grown quite a bit over the past few years. This is our, our new building. When you're in Boston, if those of you come to Croy, please come and visit. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the growth, a lot of the activities have really been um, benefited by having some wonderful executive directors, so Steve Boswell, who many of you know, uh, who's a physician but also trained in economics at the Sloan School at MIT, is really responsible for a lot of this, this growth. So at the present time, uh, we ask everybody who comes in as a routine part of clinical care about their sexual orientation, their gender identity. 25,000 people uh, uh, access services. So that means 9,000 people didn't want to disclose that information, at least at intake. But about, it's about um, half of the people are sexual gender minority individuals. And um, it's not as if I think that every LGBT person should be getting their care at a place like Fenway, but I also think that centers like that, and you have the L LA Gay and Lesbian Center here, uh, are important uh, almost in terms of sentinel surveillance, uh, picking up trends, and hopefully setting up standards of care, standards of excellence for provision of care in uh, other kinds of, of settings. 
But it gives us a unique vantage point to look at both HIV infected, uninfected individuals, and also to do some case control and other kinds of studies looking at uh, sexual gender minority individuals and other individuals. Within Fenway, there's the Fenway Institute, uh, which I co-chair with colleague Dr. Judy Bradford. And that, that's the part of the health center that's not delivering primary care services, uh, who's not um, providing mental health services, uh, medical services. But these are individuals who are doing the, the clinical research studies. Rafi mentioned we're involved with a lot of different NIH committees. We've also had an electronic health record. So we've been able to be part of some of these large database projects. And so sort of my my new learning is about big data over the past few years with some of the cohort studies, particularly the ones that are not HIV focused, like CHARN, which is a network of 17 safety net community health centers around the US with about a million people. And then ADVANCE is one of these BACORI funded initiatives that has like about 10 million people and trying to figure out what can you ask reasonably and not ask. Because as we know, RCTs, as uh, Dr. Curry knows better than most, are not, a, you know, the care and feeding of RCTs is a very precious and important thing, but not always easy. And in this day and age, uh, may not be the most cost efficient ways to glean all the data we need. So th the new paradigm. So part one is the issue of, we used to call it treatment as prevention. Now we can unequivocally say it's treatment as treatment. But the, you know, we've had studies like START and Tempano that say, as soon as a person knows that they're HIV infected and is ready to initiate treatment, they should begin treatment. Um, we also know from studies like HB10052, uh, that treatment is prevention. Now, one of the caveats about HB10052, given in the US, given the disproportionate number of new infections among men who have sex with men is, it, you know, does treatment as prevention work for men who have sex with men who might have other partners? Uh, uh, does it work in the real world? Well, Andrew Grulick, uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, folks in, in Rio, Beatrice Greenstein, and at the Thai Red Cross, Nitya uh, Pop Popinot, um, has put together a cohort, an observational cohort, of um, HIV discordant uh, uh, men who have sex with men uh, couples. This, it's an ongoing study, but at least the initial data, when, when, uh, when they looked at condomless uh, um, anal intercourse, which is what CLAI stands for, when individuals were suppressed, they didn't see any uh, transmissions occurring um, with thousands, you know, 5,656 um, number of acts. So the confidence interval still um, doesn't exclude the possibility that if you had 10 times as many people or 100 times as many people, you might see transmissions. But we certainly can say that uh, whether it's uh, homosexual or heterosexual intercourse, uh, people who are virologically suppressed are extremely rare um, if able to transmit HIV. But the other finding from um, uh, the study is protection from whom. So they looked at uh, people's uh, patterns. These are people who both signed informed consent to go in the study as a discordant couple. But they looked at how many individuals had outside partners in the relationship. Uh, almost 40% had an outside partner. Uh, uh, this was particularly tr uh, true among the Australians. And then if you looked at any condomless anal intercourse with outside partners, uh, you can see again that um, substantial numbers of individuals have outside partners. So treatment as prevention is, is great if it, your only partner is the primary partner who is virologically suppressed. But that really sets up the reason why we also have to think about PrEP. And, this is just an array of the different studies, uh, the different efficacy trials that, uh, that many of you are familiar with. Uh, and we can see that most of them um, are exceeding zero, that there are the st studies in women uh, which um, did not show efficacy, which had uh, very poor correlation in terms of um, uh, medication adherence uh, for, for the women. There are still biological questions in terms of whether there's less forgiveness for women because of the relatively lesser concentrations of tenofovir uh, and cervicovaginal uh, tissues, a longer time to get to st steady state. But certainly in women in a number of the studies who had patterns of use that were consistent with daily use were highly protected. So the overall efficacy is really quite high of PrEP. Um, and the study that I think is most important for the work that we, you're doing here in LA and that we're doing in Boston is the PROUD study, uh, which uh, was published uh, in The Lancet this year, was presented at CROI last year, because this was very much a real world study. These were men who have sex with men accessing STD services uh, at clinics in England. Uh, the National Health uh, Service said, fine, you have data from IPREX and some of these other studies that PrEP works, but in the real world, we don't know if it's um, something we want to endorse because it's potentially very expensive. The number needed to treat might be very high. So let's see what happens in the real world. And because you're in the UK and you may be willing to um, uh, be, be randomized to queues, we'll randomize people to immediate versus uh, deferred 
access to PrEP. Uh, you'll be given everything else in terms of the panoply of things we have. We'll, we'll diagnose and treat your SCDs. If you need to come in for post-exposure prophylaxis, we'll provide it, and about a third of the people came in for PEP. But even in the setting where the people who were in the delayed arm knew that they weren't getting any pr uh, protective chemo prophylaxis, um, the um, efficacy was 86% overall uh, with intent to treat. And the number needed to treat because the rate of uh, HIV infection was so high in the deferred group, almost 9% per year, was um, you needed to tr um, offer PrEP to 13 MSM in this setting uh, to prevent one new HIV infection. So clearly, very cost effective in this context. And I think these data really um, uh, are uh, some of the more important data recently, I think, that have to inform public health policy. Uh, San Francisco Health Department, Al Liu and Stephanie Cohn uh, had a recent paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine, um, and basically uh, they are seeing very few new HIV infections in the in demonstration project, virtually none, but very high um, SDI incidence uh, in this setting. And at Fenway, uh, it's very similar. Uh, we have seen a massive upscale in the number of individuals starting PrEP starting in 2014. The data in 2015 are even, even greater. We're just assembling the, the full year's picture now. Majority of people who initiated PrEP are still on PrEP. We have some people now who've been on as long as uh, almost four years. Uh, majority were gay men. Um, um, the sociodemographics are reflective of the community, which uh, Boston is not as diverse as Los Angeles, so it means that it's about a quarter of the individuals are uh, men of sex with men from communities of color. Uh, there's some self-selection. Um, 158 zip codes are represented. Fenway has a catchment area that extends throughout southern New, New England, uh, but this is somewhat greater. So that certainly suggests that there are people coming to the center because they feel it's a place that they can access it. Uh, the Gaberhood uh, South End, uh, where uh, somebody in the front uh, uh, audience used to live, uh, less than 10% of the PrEP users are from there. Uh, and, um, and because we have health insurance, uh, you know, pretty much everybody has their PrEP paid for. Uh, there's also the diffusion of innovation. Um, initially, we were only doing PrEP as a research study. We were one of the two sites uh, for IPREX and one of the three earlier sites for the CDC PrEP safety study. So, by this time, we'd been uh, uh, making PrEP available for almost a decade, but uh, primary care providers were very skeptical initially. Now the vast majority of people who prescribe medications at Fenway um, have prescribed PrEP. Uh, and we think that about a quarter of the HIV uninfected men who have sex with men at Fenway are, are currently on PrEP. Uh, we also have very high local viral suppression rate, and we are seeing a decrease in the number of new HIV infections. But very much like San Francisco, we are seeing um, uh, really a takeoff in the STDs. So you can see at Fenway, the majority of um, syphilis cases have been among men who have sex with men. But if you look at the blue line, in 2000, uh, it was a, a few tens of individuals who were diagnosed with syphilis. And by uh, this past year, even with data just going uh, through uh, October, you can see that we exceeded 200 new cases of syphilis. Uh, but I think the point is, let's see if we can get the, yeah. The point is that the curve was going up well before PrEP was available. So you had a massive increase to get well over 100 uh, um, over that first decade. But you can, say that you can see here that the inflection point has gone up somewhat more additionally uh, since the age of PrEP. Uh, you can see also among syphilis that it's still um, around half of the individuals are individuals who already are HIV infected. But if you transpose the, the number of people on PrEP uh, uh, approaching uh, 50 percent, so it says that we might have 100 cases of, excuse me, about 200 cases of syphilis, 100 in HIV infected, 100 in HIV uninfected, and about half of the HIV uninfected people are using PrEP. So clearly there's a correlation, and I think going forward, uh, it's hard particularly for, uh, for men of sex with men and, and for transgender women not to think about STD control and uh, PrEP uh, early treatment as not as part of a, a package. Similarly, we are seeing uh, uh, in, the, the finding that the gonorrhea rates are going up and the number of cases that are, um, that are rectal gonorrhea, and this again is only through August, so this is going to be much higher up here, um, big increase here as well. But similar to Jonathan Volk's um, article from the Kaiser uh, Permanente uh, series in uh, the Bay Area and, and the San Francisco Health Department, we are seeing virtually no incident cases of HIV in these individuals, so they're highly exposed, they're at high risk, uh, we have to um, think about how we manage their SEDs, but we also uh, need to think about how we maintain their adherence. So let's step back a little bit. If we think about why are MSM at increased risk for uh, SEDs and HIV, 
we can attribute to individual factors. We can say people have lots of partners, uh, maybe at increased risk for, for HIV. But we also have to acknowledge that there's a certain biological determinism as well, uh, two really important factors. One is that um, anal intercourse has increased susceptibility. The other is that men who have sex with men are uniquely able to be particularly susceptible to HIV, to acquire it through receptive anal sex, and to transmit HIV to subsequent partners. This becomes particularly important when we think about networks, where once you have a concentration within a, a community, and if it's a marginalized community, and if it's an intersectional community where people may, may be experiencing racism um, as, as well as homophobia, and therefore, um, and if you add to that uh, socioeconomic uh, disenfranchisement, it makes, it concentrates an epidemic, it limits partner choice, and it really accelerates transmission with, within the population. We also have to think about sexualized venues, uh, bathhouses, and cer certainly the internet, uh, a challenging place to intervene, but nonetheless an important place um, given w um, how people meet partners these days. One also has to think about a life course approach as well. So if we're going to deal with these issues, uh, to think about the fact of what, what it means to grow up and not um, feel that your identity as it's emerging is being validated um, by societal norms, be it, you know, uh, uh, until recently exclusion from the military, uh, a, a lack of uh, equal opportunity for marriage, and, and certainly when we think globally about the epidemic in these populations, criminalization, discrimination are, are major forces as well. So clearly, we, it's very easy to talk about MSM. It's a convenience term. So the society says, no, we are not twins. So, so, um, and so um, several people here in, in the room also have worked in India. I, I continue to work with a group um, in Mumbai called the Humsafar Trust. Uh, and this is their cosmology. So they, they have things like uh, Hedra, traditional transgender individuals, but also pool, pool boys and extras in movies. And they think of these as discrete uh, individual identities that people have. But, but, but clearly, um, our, how we use, view the universe is, uh, we have to be careful when we use the term MSM because it's really uh, a blanket epidemiologic term. We did a study in Mumbai uh, in the last few years where we used respondent-driven sampling, and we started off with seeds uh, who were uh, um, MSM who were married to women, and MSM who were not married to women, and then um, they were able to give out seeds. We, um, um, some of the seeds propagated well, others, uh, I didn't, but you can see here basically, uh, particularly if you do the RDS adjustment, the rates of HIV, the rates of uh, STDs were not any different. So um, identity is important in people's lives, but uh, obviously behavior is. But clearly how you message to a married MSM who says, I am a, I am a Ponte, I'm male identified, I have children, I have a wife, I'm generally just a top, you know, and therefore I, when you're giving out these flyers for these uh, effeminate individuals, it has no relevance for my life. So clearly this again has to be part of uh, how we think about approaching these issues. And I alluded to this before, I mean this life course um, perspective I think is extremely important as we think about these issues. And the reason why I, I want to come back to this is because if we're thinking about uh, biomedical interventions, um, how, how people's uh, psychosocial construct uh, 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 informs the way that they engage with, with healthcare or accessing medication is going to be very important. Uh, clearly the work of Ron Stahl is very important here, thinking about uh, syndemic conditions and uh, trying to think about what are the moderators and mediators that you can um, influence to um, optimize this. And in a more simplistic way, uh, my colleague Steve Safran uh, has done a lot of work in cognitive behavioral um, uh, psychology. So in, in this very simple model, you know, if you want to prevent disease in this case, we have to deal with the fact that you know, condoms uh, will reduce pleasure. We have to think uh, what are norms, peer norms, uh, that might influence people's uh, uptake of various uh, interventions. Uh, we have to promote self-efficacy. You do all this right, you'll have safer sex, you'll have uh, medication adherence. But all of this implodes when you have uh, depression, anxiety, mental health problems, and these are the syndemics that are really arising from those early life events. Uh, that individuals are facing. So this is really the challenge if we want to say, well, just take a pill, but it's not so easy to take a pill uh, if you're confronting all these other issues at the same time. One can also flip the, um, flip the discourse as well. So uh, Ron and um, Amy Herrick uh, looked at um, the data from the Gay Urban Men's Study and, and basically found that you know, if you had uh, three or four coexisting syndemic conditions. If you were depressed, if you had substance use, if you had been abused as a child, experienced uh, intimate partner violence, um, you had very high prevalence of recent high-risk sex, you had very high prevalence 
of HIV. But the flipping that is saying, on the other hand, here are these people who experience all these things, and 78% are not HIV infected, and 77% are not engaging in risky sex. So what are they doing right? So uh, another area where I think we have to think about is how do we support MSM resilience? So uh, St Steve and an uh, Indian colleague, Veena Thomas, uh, in, in Chennai, are PIing a study in Chennai and Mumbai, trying to look at how do you culturally tailor um, prevention interventions uh, for HIV um, the infected and at-risk um, Indian men who have sex with men and use support groups to try to normalize people's lives uh, give, to really um, uh, give people the space to talk about uh, the kinds of challenges they, they feel in society and how they can develop better strategies to cope. So I think that that's foundational if we're going to be trying to roll out some of these biomedical interventions for these populations uh, and you really need to help support uh, resilience beforehand. Jumping to PrEP, uh, back to PrEP, uh, how do we approve PrEP, chemoprophylaxis? Um, so we know that if you take the pill, it's going to work, but uh, we also know that the pill is not perfect. So there are studies underway looking at different medications for PrEP. One of them, um, the study called NextPrep that uh, Rafi has been involved in, led by Trip Gulick um, at Cornell is looking at Maravaroc-based regimens, and uh, some of those data will be reported at the retrovirus conference. Uh, there's studies uh, like um, Epergay and um, ADAPT, which are looking at less than daily dosing, event-driven uh, PrEP. And the Epergay study um, uh, certainly did uh, demonstrate efficacy. The challenge of that study was that the um, number of pills that individuals took on the average per month was about 15. So it doesn't really tell you about the most parsimonious dosing regimen. In other words, I don't know that based on Ipergay, and I'd be curious uh, uh, other clinicians here, whether you'd recommend to somebody if they said, well, I haven't had sex in the last two months, uh, should I take uh, uh, two pills before I go out tonight and a pill a day afterwards? And is that as good as if I anticipate sex next week, and should I start taking it a few days before? And I think uh, the pharmacology, if, certainly for me, I might be more um, inclined to take more pills in advance. But so. Hypergay is a great study, but it, ans it, it raises more questions than it necessarily answers. Uh, Pamina and uh, others here, uh, P Peter Anton, certainly have been very involved in microbicide work. And uh, although there are two out of three um, uh, topical um, uh, gel studies in women have not um, shown efficacy, uh, again, because of suboptimal adherence, uh, one did, uh, the, the first one, the Caprice uh, 004 study. And there are other iterations, there are other compounds, other gels that are being uh, developed, certainly Maravroc and other, other um, non-nucleoside uh, reverse transcriptase drugs are being developed as topical gels. And then the other issue is the intravaginal ring. And at the retrovirus conference, uh, uh, we will hear um, uh, the results of the Aspire study, MTN020, and that will be the first big uh, ring study. And uh, that would be very exciting if that offers another um, option for prevention. Uh, Injectables, uh, you have one of the leaders of the work on injectables here in the room. Dr. Landovitz is a protocol chair of uh, two studies uh, that will help uh, address this issue about whether injectable um, uh, integrase inhibitor, cabotegravir, given every eight weeks will protect against HIV. Uh, uh, through the HVTN, uh, and now in cooperation with the HPTN, uh, the other injectable um, approach that's being looked at is whether you could do immunoprophylaxis, whether you could people, give people antibodies that are associated with virologic suppression in animal models. These are antibodies that long-term non-progressors make. If you passively infuse these to individuals, and if you do this every couple months, will that protect people against HIV? So certainly uh, what we have today uh, right now with uh, Tenofovir FTC is PrEP 1.0, and where we're going is 2.0 or even further. But given what we have, how do we um, optimize things? Well, first of all, we again have to get back to the fact that we're not dealing with one epidemic in a discrete population, but multiple <coughs> microepidemics. So the issue of intersectionality cannot, um, you know, cannot be emphasized enough. Um, th this work by Greg Millett basically takes the cascade uh, that we're used to, breaks it into smaller component parts, and shows that every, at every stage of the cascade, black men who have sex with men compared to white men who have sex with men um, do worse have more social structural adversities and um, all resulting in much lower rates of virologic suppression. Um, and certainly um, income um, and uh, sy systematic uh, racism certainly plays a big role here. Um, here in LA, um, you were involved in a study, uh, HP10061, which documented a lot of these uh, social adversities that black MSM 
are finding. And so there is a study now that is winding down, HP10073, which uh, LA was one of uh, three sites along with uh, uh, North Carolina and Washington, DC. And this is looking at the question of whether by um, de developing culturally tailored um, care coordination by having somebody who's more than a peer, uh, essentially a, a case manager who's from the community working with uh, black men or sex with men when they initiate PrEP will PrEP uh, uptake be high and will PrEP adherence over long haul be high. And the results of that study will hopefully be presented at the retrovirus con um, conference coming up. Rafe and I have both been involved in a protocol led by uh, uh, Sybil Hosick uh, in Chicago uh, in the Adolescent Trials Network. It's a paired a uh, set of studies uh, looking at young men who have sex with men. The first study, ATN 110, enrolled up 18 to 22 year old men. Uh, the uh, um, parallel study, a sm smaller study, enrolled uh, 15 to 17 year old men. And what the study basically said was PrEP alone is not enough. Young, um, young MSM may have lots of other competing demands in their lives. <laughs> let's take some of the evidence-based interventions of the CDC and let's test the question about whether an individualized intervention, uh, personal cognitive counseling, uh, is better than a group intervention, many men, many voices. Uh, it's, it's not an efficacy trial. Uh, some of the data have been presented and, and the real take homes are number one, uh, that adherence was a challenge for the young men, particularly for black MSM over time. Uh, the uh, adherence attenuated very substantially after the first three months, and the men were seen monthly for the first three months. So one question is, do young people need more contact in order to be able to sustain um, adherence? Uh, the other finding, uh, by medical finding, was uh, that we know that tenofovir can cause decreases in bone mineral density. Um, this has um, been associated with a statistically significant but not clinically significant finding in the studies in adults. So the IPREC study found a little um, bone loss uh, uh, which tended to normalize if, if people uh, stopped the medication. Uh, this is also seen in um, a sub-study of partners PrEP study. So it's <laughs> men, women, uh, uh, heterosexual, homosexual. You can see some bone loss. We know this in people living with HIV but again not generally associated with anything clinically significant. However, in the um, ATN 110 study, the concern was that it was uh, because the bone is uh, elaborating uh, much more bone growth uh, during this period of time, uh, even through uh, the 22 years of age, um, you could see more attenuation or more bone loss potentially uh, with um, exposure to tenofovir, and we did see that. Again, was not associated with any clinically significant findings, though the concern was that because there was uh, relatively modest levels of adherence, that if you really got an intervention that was um, very successful in making youth highly adherent, could you see more significant bone loss? So we're hoping in future uh, studies through, um, through um, uh, NIH-funded networks to be able to answer some of these questions. So given what we have today, tenofovir FTC, what can we do to optimize uh, PrEP adherence? So one of the seminal studies was the work by Lester and colleagues uh, in Western Kenya, where they found that uh, you know, simple text messaging once a week was associated with a uh, decrease um, in um, uh, viral load, was associated with virologic suppression. So just using electronic technology to have contact with uh, people at least living with HIV made sense. Many people have investigated the use of the WISE pill, so it's a cell phone-like device. Um, it uh, be a pill box. You know when the pill box is open, and you can give prompts. And so uh, Life Steps was a cognitive behavioral um, uh, therapy uh, intervention with eight, uh, eight sessions, excuse me, four sessions uh, developed by Steve Safran for people living with HIV and was associated with improved adherence. So Steve and I tried to adapt this for uh, PrEP use, including daily SMS uh, prompts to check on people's patterns of behavior was, was highly acceptable. And uh, at the end of the day in the intervention group, at six months, 84% um, had drug levels consistent with daily uh, medication use. So we're hoping to scale that up into a more formal RCT. Uh, Reve and Miko has developed Next Step Counseling, which is a very interactive uh, uh, way of um, engaging people in problem solving. And um, um, in the IPREX open label study, uh, they used an electronic um, diary in San Francisco and Chicago, and this was also associated with improvements in adherence. And very exciting work going on here um, at UCLA, led, led by Rafi Landowitz, is giving people feedback on drug levels if the adherence isn't, uh, isn't so good. Though I think many of us are finding that the people who self-select to take PrEP, actually the adherence is, is pretty good and, and, you know, in the U.S. context. Again, um, most of the early adapters are highly self-empowered people educated, they come to the trial, once it's open label, they know they're getting PrEP, they feel motivated to take, take PrEP. So we have to think about 
how robust some of these interventions may be for people who may not be as uh, motivated to start PrEP. Uh, Susan Bookbinder uh, and Javier Lama have been developing an app, uh, SexPro, uh, to um, allow people to um, input data, have a personal diary, and see whether that's going to help people engage in PrEP. And another approach which hasn't been used uh, very much uh, yet, but uh, shows some success uh, in the Partners PrEP study, was identifying people who were not using the medication as um, effectively or as, as often, and actually having home visits and, and doing uh, pill counts. And this was acceptable in uh, Uganda and Kenya. The question is whether this, again, would be acceptable approach or even a, um, a economically feasible approach in other settings. But clearly, there's a whole robust agenda just to figure out how we can do things that are uh, not heavy-handed but can assist people in maintaining adherence to the medication. I just want to highlight there are a couple other populations where we um, have not really done enough research. There's all kinds of biases on study sections, but I know people here have had some interest in these areas. Um, we know HIV prevalence among um, MSM sex workers is extremely high. Um, I have a colleague uh, who's at Brown University, Omar Galarraga, who's uh, a behavioral economist, and he's very interested in looking at um, the role of various kinds of uh, conditioning with um, modest cash transfers, um, again, to see if this can motivate people to test, to engage in care, those who are infected to uh, become virologically suppressed, and potentially to um, uh, whether they'll access PrEP. And he's been working with uh, this uh, Mexico City government uh, that runs a big uh, clinic in downtown Mexico for uh, male and female sex workers. And they have some interest because they have uh, uh, protocols for uh, uh, social welfare support in other ways with other behavioral economic approaches. So this doesn't seem so um, incongruent in, in their, their setting. So stay tuned for that. And this is just a plug, because I know that you have a lot of bathhouses here in LA. So this is one of my more frustrating parts of, of research. Uh, uh, and Boston basically zoned out their bathhouses. Uh, they, they never closed them down, but they um, made the, um, the, code, the, the fire code or whatever so onerous that the bathhouse owner said, ah, we're not going to make enough money here. So they, they pulled out. Uh, Providence, uh, uh, those of you who know the Northeast, is. Uh, the, Providence is a lovely Brown University on College Hill and, and RISD, but also has a very gritty side. And off of the highway, there's actually a red light district that's uh, fairly unique, where there's a strip club, um, bookstore, and in the middle of that is, is a uh, very poorly maintained but very large uh, bathhouse, the, the largest in New England. And the owners allowed us to uh, go in and start implementing uh, various kinds of testing. You can see here the, uh, the HIV prevalence was certainly higher than any voluntary counseling site we saw. Uh, hepatitis C prevalence, syphilis. You know, so we definitely were able to pick up STDs. We actually asked uh, the patrons also um, uh, what their behaviors were, um, unprotected anal, unprotected uh, oral um, uh, sex um, back then. And we saw um, that the prevalences of the, of, of the at-risk behaviors were as high. But we also found a disjunction that the majority of the people who were engaging in behaviors that could uh, put them at risk for HIV or STDs didn't think they were very risky at all. So it seemed like a great place for um, intervention, but study sections have not uh, seen their, their way clear. And I know from other individuals like William Woods in um, San Francisco, this has always been a challenge, but I still think it's an important place because uh, uh, there's many people in this room who are doing work on the internet, but I find it very challenging to do interventions. It's a great place to uh, do education, and it's a great place to do surveys, as I'll show you, but, but actually being able to reach out, whereas when you have the physical body in the bathhouse, there's an awful lot you could do. So again, I think we have to think creatively. Um, uh, an area that's uh, very well known to uh, uh, Dr. Klausner and Dr. Clark, uh, and Dr. Coates is uh, Lima, and um, the other, the other group were, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we're not going to be able to do justice about all the unique factors, but we certainly can't ignore the fact that we have to culturally tailor PrEP for transgender women. And you can see the, um, the data from impact of the large um, NGO um, there that in, for all, you know, whether you look at um, uh, syphilis, whether you look at HIV, uh, the rates are, uh, the health disparities are even higher for transgender women compared to MSM in the, these settings. So just trying to dial back about um, PrEP in the US. Uh, so how many people should be on PrEP in the US? And the CDC actually came out with revised numbers that surprised some people as being fairly high. Uh, the most challenging population is um, the one that, uh, the third bullet, 0.4% of heterosexual adults, because that, that translates to 624,000 individuals. Very hard 
population because a lot of those individuals may need PrEP because of partners who have not disclosed their behaviors. Um, um, a study done in the HIV Prevention Trials Network of uh, uh, women, primarily women of color, um, the ISIS study, HP10064, uh, found 0.5% uh, HIV prevalence um, uh, doing testing on 2,000 women up and down uh, the East Coast. Um, and th so you say prevalence is fairly low, but, 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 the, but the bottom line was because if, you, if, you're de if your demographic is just saying, we'll go into this community that has high HIV and we'll, you know, we'll offer PrEP to everyone, that's, that's not going to work. So I, I really think for those of you who are uh, doing research uh, uh, in underserved populations, particularly uh, communities of color, this, this is the hardest nut to crack about how to get PrEP um, uh, um, right you know, for the population. Because uh, certainly for men who have sex with men, it's a matter of getting uh, the individuals to acknowledge their risk or getting the clinicians to be able to create a welcoming environment to dis um, discuss um, the issues. But certainly uh, with the latest figures from um, um, Gilead, uh, it's certainly it's still at tens of thousands of individuals. So if, we, if there are a million people who should be on PrEP, we clearly have a long way to go. So Manhunt is a, a social networking site. It's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so I've uh, worked with them on a number of different surveys over the years. So we had two waves of surveys in August 2013 and January 2014, uh, the national uh, samples of men who have sex with men. And basically you can see that um, uh, the, the PrEP uptake, at least at that point, had been, had been fairly limited. Um, and uh, even the PrEP knowledge um, had gone up over the last couple of years. But not that high. Uh, again, I think we're hitting an inflection point and it would certainly be interested in doing a new survey at some point in the near future. Uh, when we went back and looked actually at the individuals, because we had such a large end, we we're still able to have en enough power to be able to look at who were the early adopters. So no surprise, they tended to be uh, college educated. Um, uh, they also had a good reason for perceived vulnerability and interaction with the healthcare system. They had, had an SDI, they had used PEP. But one of the other um, um, issues that came out independently in the multivariable analysis was that, they, um, that those who were comfortable talking with their provider about MSM sex were more likely to use PrEP. Katie Oldenburg, uh, who's a graduate student at Harvard School of Public Health, who's collaborating with uh, Jesse Clark as well as many other folks, um, had a very interesting uh, social ecological idea. Uh, with Mark Katzenbuehler at Columbia University, they went back, they said, well, we have enough people in different states the Human Rights Campaign actually um, has an uh, index of tolerance of like, you know, which states are more affirmative or um, more repressive around LGBT issues. You know, which states have marriage equality, have partner uh, benefits. And they, they did the map of the US, and, the, and not surprisingly, uh, Mississippi was at one end, Massachusetts, California were at, other, at the other end of the spectrum. And they found that the people who were in the states that were not supportive um, or that were supportive were more likely to have used PrEP be out to their providers, but less likely to engage in condomless sex. And the flip side, that if you're in a very red state, you're, um, it's very risky. <laughs> what did I do? So, so again, PrEP is increasing over, over, the, um, over the next um, few quarters. You can see um, this kind of increase. I know, sorry, why, why I'm doing this. Um, and this is just uh, data provided by Gilead now of the number of cities where they provided uh, drug for demonstration projects. So certainly you can see sort of the diffusion of innovation uh, um, across the country, and certainly not everything is only on the coast. But this is where i uh, come to the last part of the talk, which is uh, who's going to provide PrEP? So I'm working with Doug Krakauer, uh, who's a, a young infectious disease uh, physician on his K. It's very much about doctor-provider communication. He coined the term the purview paradox, which is basically this, that infectious disease specialists say, I, you know, I'm used to taking care of people with HIV. I don't want to spend a lot of time counseling high-risk uninfected people. And generalists are saying, well, you know, um, I'm not that comfortable um, using these drugs. I'm not, I don't really have a lot of time to talk to my patients about sex. So uh, nobody's really taking on uh, the responsibility. And you superimpose that with the fact that there's a long history of bias in healthcare. So if, um, the key populations of individuals who benefit from PrEP are sexual gender minority individuals or racial ethnic minority individuals. Um, uh, there are a number of um, um, studies that show that consumers, particularly for LGBT people, have experienced a good deal of um, uh, disrespect and discomfort engaging the healthcare providers. Um, and this sort of gets into a little bit of my soapbox. Uh, a, a colleague of mine who Tom Coates uh, know, knows well is uh, Harvey McAdon, who has a grant from uh, the um, Health Resource Service Administration to provide training to primary care providers on uh, sexual gender minority health. And 
the website's uh, lgbthealth.org. Uh, but, but basically, you know, it's an intrinsic human right. Um, you know, so on one hand, I'd like to say that, you know, because of PrEP and because of sexual health, uh, you know, asking about sexual health should be a fifth vital sign. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you have people um, really refraining from that, the providers being uh, uncomfortable, and many of the clients um, having uh, memories of bad experiences when they were younger. So this is something that we really have to remedy if we're going to be able to scale this, this up. Uh, just even in a liberal area like New England, uh, in 20, late, late 2013, early 2014, uh, Doug Krakauer um, um, uh, surveyed all the um, people who went to New England AIDS Education Training Center programs, and you can see more red than green. In other words, more perceived barriers uh, than acceptance. More recently, um, we just published this in uh, the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. Uh, there's a listserv uh, for epidemics that go around the country. So uh, it had um, about 800 infectious disease doctors, about 415 of them responded to our survey. And in this one, we found that the majority of uh, providers, almost all said they were comfortable st about starting heart independent of a CD4 count. But then we asked different hypotheticals of what might make you wait. And we found the one that stood out was that two thirds said they'd defer heart if they had a patient who was an active substance user. And then we went back and said, well, we also asked them about PrEP and you can see uh, that about 31% had prescribed PrEP at this point in time about two-thirds um, thought that it was part of their uh, responsibility, could consider it as part of clinical care. But we again found that those who were feeling that they would defer heart were also less likely to want to prescribe PrEP. So we do have a long ways to go in terms of trying to work with our providers because these are biomedical interventions. Um, I'm interested in Dr. Klausner's um, working on a piece about um, PrEP is similar to aspirin, but I don't think we're quite there yet at the present time. So, uh, so just in trying to, summarize, um, it's all about, first of all, trying to increase HIV testing uh, because you have to know your serostatus. status. There are many people in this room who've really done some remarkably creative work in that regard. Once you, once you test, then it's the triage. And you know, it, um, if you test positive, there's all these steps uh, go through the cascade to get to the point of virologic suppression. Um, if you test negative, it doesn't mean everybody should be on PrEP, but you, everybody deserves risk assessment, adherence counseling if, um, uh, if they go on PrEP. So it still is part of a package. And we're not going to get anywhere if we don't address the concomitant uh, uh, social and structural issues that really um, impede people's willingness to engage in care, access PrEP, or the reasons why they may be engaging in behaviors that put themselves at risk for HIV and STDs in the first place. So with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you for your attention, and I think there's a little time for some discussion.